Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, listeners. Today, I have something a little bit different for you. I have Brett Sweet. He created an entire music album in honor of his dad. So thanks for joining me, Brett. Thank you for having me. So why don't you tell us a little bit about you and your journey with your dad and your caregiving journey, and then we'll kind of get into the album as well. Sure. So my name is Brett Sweet. Um, I am a social entrepreneur, which means basically I'm really interested in investing and setting up business models that not only make money, but really are measured by social change. So I work in a lot of different fields. Um and have set up a lot of models to try to push this forward. Um, I'm an author. Uh, I've, I've done education. I've created and invented some technology. Um, I've di- I, used, I started my career as a musician in the hip hop industry. Uh, I've done a lot of podcasts about health and leadership and economic development. And then um, I'm also really interested in trying to coaching people. So this is something that's close and dear to my heart. Um, My father was my role model, my best friend, my mentor, and uh, the bully who set me straight when I needed to to have it. Um, And so uh, in 2005, my father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And um, I'm sure you know, uh, when you're diagnosed before 80, um, it can be pretty aggressive. Um, They were very clear about this with us. and there was a certain period of time that we were given before, um, you know, that we would no longer have a, my father around, who was just the center of not only my nuclear family, but this entire, you know, my father was the youngest of nine, but he was in charge of everybody. <laughs> things, you know, um, he was, he was, you know, the patriarch is, is, is sort of understates his position. You know, um, he was, he was sort of the King Arthur of, of our family. And uh, that was a huge shock. And so overnight, um, I had to learn about this disease and I had to learn about, you know, my father and I had to learn about being the best possible son I could be and by helping take care of him. Um, In fact, my father being a lawyer and a civil rights attorney, I remember when I told him I was going to take care of him, he said he might let me. (laughs) In fact, uh, he was very careful. He wanted to make sure I wasn't giving up my life to take care of him. He wrote, he had some uh, conditions in this contract. He had goals for me. I had to go, I had to finish, go and considering not finishing my master's degree to take care of him. I had to do that. I had to keep my job. I wasn't allowed to become depressed. I wasn't allowed to become bitter. Um, He had, yeah, he had a shopping list for me. And so as I went through this process of taking care of my father, I learned so much about him and myself and, and, and the difference between his illness and who he was as a person through all the stages. Um, and then I started finding myself at a place where um, the decline happened and we were going to the emergency room three, four times a week, five times hard to, you know, let's say something like 2008, I just gave up on sleeping because between working going to school and taking care of my father. I just was, I was always up in the middle of the night with him, right? You know, the journey. Yep. And uh, it just didn't make sense anymore. And I kept showing up at these places and, and, and the ER especially, and they tell me, oh, you're such a good son. And I, I just didn't understand what that meant. And then I started looking around and I realized there's not a lot of other kids hanging out. I was at the Alzheimer's home, um, Lakeside, uh, which I believe is still age time. Um, and I kept hearing that. And I've noticed that parents, parents had their children on visiting day. I was there every day. And I started to understand generally when I had conversations with people about what it meant to be a caregiver, they didn't understand what I was talking about. So um, I lost my father in 2010. It was, it was a pretty heartbreaking for me. And as I was going through the process, um, my my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, um, encouraged me to begin writing again, especially music, because that's where I, I was coming out of. 
And um, she wanted me to write about my father as a form of therapy. And so as I started writing about it, it started becoming descriptive um, about this disease and about being a caregiver. And it took a life of its own and it, it moved from a therapy to sort of an instruction manual. And I started to realize a couple of facts that um, I was watching that actor, Seth Rogen, who was very connected to our cause. And he's in front of Congress explaining things. And it's even as he tries to talk about it, there's sort of a lot of smirks in the audience, like this, dis this disbelief that he's talking about this savage disease and that it's not as much of a threat, you know? Um, fast forward to 2020, and we see COVID where it was, where it was the most deadly was in these, these Alzheimer's homes. And you go, okay, this could have been thought about then. So what I realized is if, you know, the number one export of the United States is, um, is culture. And out of that culture, we love sending out music. And out of that right now, and for the last 10 years, it's been hip hop. So billion, if not trillion dollar industry. And given that I had a lot of it, a lot of influence in creating that industry, I thought this was an opportunity um, to change the topic because I didn't want this to be one of those dirty little secrets. You know, we used to call it being senile. Mm -hmm. you know, we don't talk about it. We're afraid of this. People are more willing to talk about cancer, right, than they are Alzheimer's. And, there's st and we're more willing to talk about COVID. We're more willing to talk about Ebola. These are scary things. But Alzheimer's, hey, let's change the subject. It's almost up there like, you know, politics and religion or something. You don't talk about this at the dinner table. And then I realized how many uh, Jennifers and Bretts are out there that are not finding community. And that had to change for me. So I decided um, to put my money where the mouth was and say, let's put an album out here, change the conversation a little bit. And then also we're listening to rap music when we go to the gym. We're listening to it for that long drive to get your parent back to the hospital or the home. But the music that you're listening to is not reflective of the care to giver's journey. So I wanted to make a soundtrack. I wanted to give something that people could immediately draw energy from um, because all of the different roles we have to be as a caregiver for this parent um, and, and, and sort of not only create this, this, this sense of connection, but also help people realize that um, there's these skills they're developing and taking care of their parent that are going to show up in great ways in their job, in their, in their partnerships with their spouse, and being a parent, being a mentor, all these other places, and that this is not the end of the road. This is actually the beginning. Um, and given who my father was, he was just this tiny little handicapped man from from Florida in a very dark time in America's history. And he just decided everything he did, he was about breaking the rules. He was about opening doors for people. And this was just going to be one more thing for him that he was going to look at Alzheimer's as being the civil rights attorney he was. This is just another bully he's going to stand up to. And so I wanted to make sure that I could continue that story and uh, add a little bit of hope to the conversation again. Yeah, we could definitely use that. It's interesting because my mom likely had early onset Alzheimer's. She wasn't formally diagnosed till she was 69, but that is because she resisted getting diagnosed. By the time she was diagnosed, she was like mid-stage and, and we were all like, yeah, <laughs> tell us something we didn't know. I mean, it was just, it was, it was obvious her mom had vascular dementia. I also think she might've had something else. I got I got to do some little little bit more research on vascular dementia in the end stages because she appeared to have more of the Alzheimer's end stages than vascular. But again, I'm not super familiar with that one, so I got to do a little research. And my maternal great grandmother also had quote senile dementia, which is what they called it back when you and I were tiny or pre. She died before I was born, so whatever you want to call that. Yeah. You know, a lot of the a lot of the people that I talk to have taken care of a spouse or we talk to the millennials and I'm pretty much guessing that you and I are Gen X. I know I'm a Gen Xer, but I'm looking at you going, yeah, you got to be Gen X. Yeah, too. I, I think they rebranded us recently. I still don't understand. I, I do have a degree in marketing. I still don't understand what they're trying to do, but I think we're Xennials, right? Like oh, I, have, I thought I thought that was the the the, the older the super young millennials into the 
Gen Zers? I thought that's the young Gen Xers or the old millennials. I think it's identical. I really do think it's a value system. I always make the joke like my older brothers, I have two older brothers, they're definitely Generation X, but I think we identified with different things, you know, uh, what was interesting, you know, like I think they were, you know, Nirvana. I remember listening to Nirvana for the first time and bringing it home. And for them, they were, it was like, oh, this is a cool band. And for me, it's like, um, I'm glad somebody's calling out the BS, right? So I think there's idealism of difference from us. So, but that yes, we're in def- I'm definitely in that age group of, yes, I grew up with Transformers and G.I. Joe and one, Schwarzenegger one-liners, and, you know, things of that nature. So yeah, I, I, it, it's amazing how much has changed in such a short time around these, these conversations and, and titles and, and labels. It's really important. That's true. And it's, I, I love being in between the boomers who are taking care of spouses yes. or extra older parents yes. and the millennials who are taking care of parents and maybe in some respects grandparents because the, the boomers are like, I don't understand why these people are showing all of their loved ones online and, and it's so disrespectful, blah, 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 blah. And the millennials just put it all out there. And then there's me in the middle when my, when I first started doing the podcast, I didn't use, I didn't use photos or videos of my mom because I felt like that was disrespectful. I know she would have murdered me if she had known what I had, (laughs) what I did end up doing in the end. So it's, I look, it's kind of interesting to be in the middle to see the shift. But one of the things... Yeah, one of the things that massively frustrates me, you know, like our government has been having this ridiculous debate on the social safety net for caregiving, you know, yes. for parents and caregivers of the el- you know, we don't, we don't call them elderly, the older adults. Yeah. And it's like I I have a business degree and it's like isn't this like basic, you know, elementary school logic where if you want people to work, to build the economy, then you got to help them get out of the house and they can't get out of the house. If they got kids that need daycare, it costs more than their salary, or they've got an older parent they're taking care of. And we know that costs more than we make. So it's like, I don't understand why this is a debate. (laughs) I'll come back to that one. I think something that you really highlighted was, um, you know, I remember when I was putting together the album covers, I was very intentional about making sure everything was a memory of my father. Because some of the things was like, I felt like this disease had robbed us of these memories. And especially I remember on a tangent, I remember somebody was was great enough to start a Wikipedia page for my father. And then Wikipedia voted it down. And I was like, how dare you? Like, you've just stood right next to the enemy, you know, Um, and not understanding the disease and not understanding how how that could feel like a below the belt punch. Um, but I did, you know, there was a lot of people who came to my father's memorial who said I had no idea. And, you know, and, and yeah, I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to do that to my dad. I wasn't going to send these horror store pictures, you know? Right. Um, I wasn't going to send, I know exactly what you mean. Like there's, I can send stuff before he sort of declined, but there's, there's only a very private few of people who, you know, there might be a moment where my dad was like uh, non-vocal but he would kind of talk with his eyes, you know, and do the, the intuitive thing. And I remember um, when I got into business school, like it was the first time I'd seen him really like light up. And there was like, we always, there's this great um, anime that I liked called Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. And there was like about this kid whose spirit gets trapped in the suit of armor. And it kind of reminded me of my dad, how the body's there and you see this, this little person is trapped inside this. And if you give them time, they can come out to the surface and you see the personality, but then unfortunately biology pulls them back in and then they can't, they can't talk anymore. So I think curating these memories and curating these photos, but also being mindful to not, sh- I see why millennials share everything because they feel like everything in the world is taking truth away from their knowledge of their parent. And so they're like, I'm not going to do that. And I think the boomer culture, um, I think my mom is from the, my dad was a boomer. I think my mom was after, which was the silent generation. I know both my parents grew up during World War II and the, um, the, 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 I was about to say the Great Depression, but I think we just went through one too. So, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, 
but uh, there is a sense of you, what happens in the home does not leave the home. You don't put all your information out there. And, and a lot of those values are really important, right? Um, because you don't want to expose everybody and traumatize everybody to what's going on. But there is, as, there is some aspect of if we don't talk about it, if we don't point it out, if we don't sort of circle it with the marker, we're not going to be able to come up with good solutions if we don't, because it, it's easy to complain all day. That's true. Um, so there's, there's, there's so much to that. And then I think with the, the debate, labels are so important. So we are in a place in this country where I think sometimes people will debate something on its principle without being honest that they are a beneficiary of it, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's one of those things with the safety, right? So people have the right to cut the safety net as long as they want to opt out of it too. And that's not the requirements we do, right? Like people will go, oh, well, you know, why am I paying into this? Cool. If you don't, if, if you don't think this is valuable, I'm here and you don't ever have to get a social security pay ever in your life, right? That will fix the system, but that's not the requirement. We're allowed to wax poetically about things, right? Um, and we see this so many times. And so I don't want to make it too much about attacking politicians, but I think it's easy to make policy that you don't actually have to feel. Um, and, and it doesn't come home to you and it's not real. And it's also, it's not curious, but the people that are in Washington debating about this, you know, what, what does a Senator make? What, like 200 K? Yeah. That's it's not, not a lot. Not a lot. Right. But well, I mean, it is a lot, but it's not a lot, but it's, you know. it's enough to pay for care. Let's start there. Right. As opposed to the exposed to the 99% of the constituencies that they're supposed to represent who cannot pay for that care. So you're absolutely right. I think this is a very good time for us to transform the economy, which is something I work in and talk about um, concessions and things for caregivers, but also working from home and, and, and flexibility. Like as I, we started our conversation with, I remember when I started my career, you know, early mid twenties or something, there was always time for my coworkers if they came in late because their kid did not want to go to daycare that day or go whatever. There was always a sense of flexibility around that. But if I said, "Hey, you know, I would like to work from home today because you know I was up all night with my dad in the ER," there's just no frame of reference. With that. And so I think it's I think it's finally caught up. But now we still have another push to talk about of, of you know maybe we should be. Maybe we should be subsidizing people who are staying at home, taking care of parents and things like that. We have to look at this model a little bit differently because um, it's not for lack of will. It's just people really do have their back against the wall. And it's just not as simple. Um, and we're learning that. It's just not as simple as, you know, let's vaccinate everybody's parents and they're going to be safe. No, they still we still got to feed them. We still have to take them to the bathroom, remind them how to wipe. And there's this big aspect of it about dignity. There's still people, yeah. Um, you know, like just think about things. There's things that you would, you know, I, 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 it's a bit of a tangent, but I remember um, a couple of years ago, I was a larger version of myself. Um, I was very, very overweight after taking care of my dad. My body just broke down. Um, and I made a dedication to myself and my wife that I was going to take better care of myself and so I wanted to start losing weight. And so I decided I was going to start jogging. And so one day my wife and I, we said, we're just going to jog in our neighborhood. We'll go three blocks. We start jogging and she's much shorter than me. And she was just, I had been an athlete. You know, I've been a pretty high level martial artist. I just could not take the idea that my wife, who is much shorter than me, was just making me look like a sloth with her running. So I start running really hard to catch up with her. And finally, like, in my head, I'm like, ha, all right, I get up there. And then I'm like, oh, my God, everything hurts. Everything hurts. Oh, my God. And she's like, well, slow down then. And I remember sending the message from the brain to the legs to slow down, and it wouldn't work. And what ended up happening was, and you can laugh at this, I end up like, you remember that TV show, The Greatest American Hero? Oh, yes. My dad loved I, that I show. I literally did one of those moves where I ended up flying through this lady's fence and just like sliding through her yard and kind of like laying against her butt. You know, and when my wife was done laughing, she was like sitting down next to me and just like telling the woman in the world, like, you don't have to call the 
she he's, he does this okay <laughs> but i think what was the value of it was it reminded me that i took running for granted there was 20 years i didn't run i didn't warm up and then, and then i just assumed i just knew i was just so entitled that it, on the drop of a dime i can just jog and i think those are the kind of memories that we should have put in people's brains to say, I want you to think about all the things that you do every day that you take for granted, that if it was taken away from you, how would you feel, right? How would you interact? How would you look? Some, and that's kind of with our parents, um, you know, and even I'm still a caregiver for my mom who lives with me and my wife and my mother-in-law. And she doesn't have Alzheimer's, but she, you know, she's in a wheelchair. She's very, it's very hard for her to walk and do things and just trying to talk to her about certain stuff about she's, she doesn't want to admit that she can't make meals for herself. And she's certainly right. But, and she's certainly not okay with her child that she created from her own flesh and blood, always trying to cook for her. She's not going to do that. Right. And so there is a balance there with that dignity. That's part of the conversation that I've been working to change is this mindset that we have to be able to be 100% independent yes. from right this second to the day we draw our last breath. And that's not, you know, that's not necessarily reality. And I, I kind of tie it into, you know, like you're 85 years old, you've been retired for a while. Why the hell do you want to live, <clears throat> excuse me, in a single family home that you got to worry about maintenance of the home, the exterior, main, you know, maintaining the cleanliness of the inside. Some, you got to cook for yourself. You got to clean. Why the hell do you want to do all that? You've worked hard for 85 years, raised families, worked, created jobs, whatever you've done. I mean, we've all done stuff. Yeah. You know, it's okay to say, I'm going to go move into an independent living community where yeah. somebody else is worried about the building and the yard and the cooking, and I can get up and decide to do whatever the hell I want to do. I want to go all, watch. All the things go that ahead. are good for me are, are readily available. Yeah, if I get up at this time, I can go and do the stretching class. If I get up and do this time, we can watch a movie together. But yeah, I'm, I'm so with you. And what also bothers me is when you believe you've made it, sometime in your 30s to your 50s, you will pay expert amount of money to go to some resort for a vacation, right? Explain to me the difference between a resort and this 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 lifestyle you just talked about, right? It's like things don't add up. Um, That's nobody's ever put that one those two together. You you pay to go to sandals or beaches or whatever these all inclusive resorts are. I've only I mean, done that once, yeah, and right, I enjoyed right. it, but. You know? I want right. to go out and be, we were in Jamaica. I went to Jamaica for my 50th birthday. Congrats, and why nice. the hell I decided to do this? Oh, I rode my bike across the island as part of a right. Jamaican reggae ride tour, which was great, except they kept saying, this is not a race, except they wanted us to go at like a race speed and stay <laughs> close to, I'm like, <laughs> it's like, what the hell? Why did I decide to do this for my birthday? This is nuts. And then, so we went from very super active and interacting with, you know, the Jamaican tour guides and yeah. they would take us to, you know, Jamaican owned and operated restaurants and the um, like the farmer's markets, which are definitely not anything like the ones we have here. Oh. And just every, you know, just being part of their culture to then being part of this. I mean, like the Sandals Resort where it could have been anywhere right. and it was fine. But, you know, and I didn't object to having you know, a three mile buffet of food to choose from and various options and not having to worry about stuff. But yeah, I don't, nobody's ever tied those together. And I just, oh, and, and I think that's the problem with being a caregiver is that what you're asked to do when you get the resistance from your parents is, you know, they want the independence. Oh, you want to balance their sense of identity and purpose. They want purpose. They want to be able to be useful. Okay. But there's a lot of things that they fight for that are contradictory to your life experience, right? Right? So, you know, my mom has terrible eating habits, but I remember how much I used to get in trouble for trying to eat cake and ice cream before dinner, right? So it's <laughs> it just doesn't add up. And so I pointed out because it's like this forced 
it's almost this four sense of like schizophrenia or bipolar because you're like, Did those experiences actually happen is the same person who taught me to do this, that, and the other thing incapable of doing these other things and fighting for it. Like it just, it's hard. And so, you know, I think what I have to do a lot of times is learn how to frame things for people because they get really caught up on language and words. And so rather than having a, I got you moment, say, okay, the plate that you, it was served on was distasteful for you. But if we put it on this plate, which is an equivalent, I think you on its idea, on its merit, you do agree with. And let's make that work. Yeah, there's something there about that. Like, I agree with you. And, 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 and that's one of those challenges. And I also think back to what you just talked about. It is counter the human experience to think you're in it by yourself. If you go all the way back and you look at human beings and their time on this planet, we don't have to debate how long we've been here. All we need to do is look at early civilization and understand that it's based on cooperation. It's not based on, you know, you do get a couple spiritual leaders who go off and live in a cave for 20 years and come back. But the thing is, they're not only valuable if everybody else is living in the village. And we all That's work true. together. And this idea that in my elder years, I'm going to live in the single family home that I can't maintain and continue to box check. Yeah, it's problematic when, again, I think when you look at areas that have across the world that have higher quality of life, you see it's a place where our elders and our children are integrated, right? Mm -hmm. You also see that in terms of being able to hold on to intergenerational wealth because yes, you might have school and early childhood and daycare, but actually your children are interacting with their grandparents and both there's the feedback loop makes both better people. We have right? an ad, an adult day program here in town yeah. that also, well, they incorporate in the morning, they bring over the preschool children who are also attending a daycare program Yes, and they interact with the elders in the adult day social program. And in the afternoon, they bring over the older elementary school kids who can sometimes get math and reading help from the older adults who are there, you know, like my, there was a gal in my, my mom's memory community that could still read. So she could have read books to kids till she was like, yeah, get these little munchkins away from me. And maybe some of the, you know, other adults help with math. Don't ask me to do that because my brain's not good enough for that ever. But when I talked to their director about their program, the one thing yeah. that was super obvious is obviously the older adults are getting a benefit of interacting with the children and the children are benefiting from interacting with, you know, adoptive grandparents. And the the one person, the one chunk in there that wasn't present that was also benefiting was the parent caregiver person. So like if I was bringing my kids there and my mom there, I was benefiting from the benefits they were getting. And it was just eye-opening and i really wish there were more programs like that the yes. other one in town that's really popular is attached to the catholic church so a lot of the people that have their loved ones there do it because they can have mass and communion and and the rituals of their religion that are very comforting to them yeah. i still think they should incorporate the children you could do that with the religious benefits as well and then wow you might be getting even more benefits i don't I don't know, but yeah, I, I have been saying for years that true patriotism is taking care of each other. You, know, you take care of yourself, you take care of your immediate family, your neighbors, your friends, your community, and it just keeps rippling out. I mean, this is a very large, you know, geographically large state that you and I are in. We're in California, like, well, my listeners know that, but, you know, the United States is a huge place and we need these ripples to keep rippling out and taking care of each other. Cause I think there's a lot of people that feel forgotten, left behind. And I know caregivers feel that way because the system is not set up to help. You know, I follow. And it's like, just like, recent, right? It's just recent that even there was even a, it needs to get better. But I remember pre a couple presidents ago when even all those expenses, right that you would spend, like there was just no tax 
there was no tax refund or anything for caregiver expenses. You were on your own. You're coming out of pocket or just the idea that you're supposed to spend down all the wealth that your parents or the parents before them earned to take care of them. It was just ridiculous. It was, it just felt like a property grab. Um, so we're getting better, but you hit the nail on the head and, uh, I don't know. That's just the way I was raised. I know, I've never heard it. Thank you. Cause I've never heard it framed that way as patriotism, but the way I was raised was you were supposed to take care of your family and your neighbors and they're supposed to take care of you. And that the purpose is as you go up the ladder is to throw your hand down and bring people with you. It is not. And I'm really not a big fan of this. And I don't, I don't want to blame social media. I just think that it's aggravated the wound, but I am not a big fan of scoring points off the next person who's drowning clearly and being like, oh, see, that's why you're there. No, 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 that's not okay. We should all, even if I don't like the way you talk to me, look at me or whatever, I don't really need that. I I think that if there's opportunities for us all to transform each other for the better, um, some is going to be easier than the others, but we should try as best as possible to take care of each other. That's that's actually what makes this place great. Oh, totally. I don't know if you've read, I read a research article somewhat recently that said there are serious cognitive benefits to having conversations, not arguments, conversations with people who feel and believe differently than we do. Yes. And perfect example, our best friends are Catholic. I am not. And they are pro-life. I am Pro options that does not make me pro abortion. I I think I, there's. I didn't even way- know that was an option. Thank you. I'm writing that down. I did yeah. not know that I could. I did not know that there was pro options as a third. See, that's what I mean. I didn't know that. That's a perfect example. I didn't know that there were third shows. Well, and it's then, like I'm not pro abortion, but right. there's you know, I think there's times it, and places for those. But let's yeah. let's let's try to fix it so. Yeah. You know, economically, healthcare, all yeah. those things are taken care of so that. People don't want, don't feel they need to make that choice as often. Yes. But there's other reasons for it. But we've had, so one, uh, I think there was several years ago, there was a, an execution. And I used to be, back in my younger years, very pro capital punishment. I think you kill somebody, it's okay for the state to yeah, kill you. Right. And that, yeah, I mean, just made perfectly good sense. And then I remember there was an execution and I was like, I never even heard of this guy. So I looked it up and I'm like, God, this guy killed somebody like 30 years ago. I was like, I was like a young teenager, like in I, pre, not preschool, but I was going to say middle school. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like, no, it, this is not a deterrent for other people because I don't even know anything about this. So you hit the nail I, on the head. yeah, I've shifted my beliefs. You know, I, it's because we believe there's these, in, we believe that there's these outcomes, right? And I think you and I kind of work in these fields where you have to prove it, right? The money comes in and, hey, I did this, this, and this, right? And I think what happens a lot of times with our neighbors, everybody is convinced to do team us versus them, right? It's kind of why I stopped, and I think you would understand this as a Bay Area person, why I stopped watching football. Because I just watch people being willing to kill each other over two teams who don't invest in the ecosystem, And then when I go to other areas, they don't have those problems. I've never, I I don't see my New York relatives willing to kill each other over a game, right? They understand that New York's in the Super Bowl. So when you grow that idea of team us versus team them, it's very dangerous. Then there's the next one, which is, and this just goes back to what we were talking about is you believe it works this way. Do you have the data over time longitudinally to prove it? So can you show me that if we kill people, People go, you know what? I should. I was thinking about killing that guy today, but then I thought about capital punishment. I'm going to put the gun away. Yeah, no, but unfortunately, right? Yeah, we're just not quite that evolved. We're just not. It just doesn't work that way. And and also, there's also research that shows other things that happen, right? Like when you get when you see enough death happen around you, you start accepting death. Maybe you get more likely to do that. We got to be very careful about that stuff. So you bring up such amazing points. And I think it just goes down to on a basic level, like so many statements are made and we just don't have the ability right now, but we could with technology to follow those statements all the way through and see if this, then that, 
and then make our behavior match to it, right? Because any given day on an interaction, that's why people are so angry. Mm -hmm. Instinctually, intuitively, we know when we're not being told the full truth, but you don't have a feedback loop to challenge some of these basic kind of things, right? If I go to the carpool lane and I look around, 99% of the people in the carpool lane have nobody in the car and no CHP is pulling them over but you see the sign every day you're being lied to, right? Like, and it just grows, right? It just grows from there, right? Like, um, and so then people go off the deep end because they feel um, misrepresented. You know, why should I pay those taxes for those things? Uh, Why should I do this? So you're right. Um, I think back to what you're talking about, we are so encouraged to go, I'm team Brett, you're team Jennifer, let's not talk. But actually your brain grows and does so much better when you talk to somebody, you know, you know, at the beginning of the conversation, I thought that mushrooms were pretty nasty. <laughs> My dad used to make me eat them as a child. And because he couldn't cook, I have bad memories of, of mushrooms. But now after I've seen all this research about how mushrooms can, you know, fight cancer in your body. And I finally have a wife who can actually cook them well. I'm willing to try mushrooms. There's something about that, about it's not about backing down. It's about writing new subroutines with new data. And your brain loves that. Um, that is, that's a good way of putting it. There's a um, PhD. What's her name? Rhonda Patrick. And she was talking about fighting depression. You know, men in 40, they get it a lot. This can be one of the roads to Alzheimer's. But she's mm-hmm. talking about finding something that you can go from a beginner skill to an intermediate skill tends to be one of the biggest factors of fighting um, depression uh, aside from diet and exercise, right? So finding something, picking up something, that's why I think we like hobbies, right? But being okay with going like, I'm going to start surfing today because I I suck at it. And I'm going (laughs) into it knowing that I suck so that I will get skill at it later. Rather than what we tend to do is I go up and I've never played baseball before. And then I go swing at the t-ball and I miss And so I go, okay, well, I quit. This is a stupid game for stupid people. I'll never do this again. And that's what we do with people in conversations. Either either you are going to agree with me 100% or I'm going to show you why you're an infidel and we will burn you and your village, right? And I think it actually, what it really, to, to your point, it really just needs to be who I was at 20 is not who I am at 40. And what you just said to me I've actually seen some anecdotes in my brain about it. I've looked this research. I've been able to read. Man, this is not about you scoring points. I'm learning some new information, and I really appreciate you for that. But you have to be, you have to frame yourself as a learner. You have to be willing to want to learn, to see, to see that something, something good will come out of wanting to learn. And that, that's very hard to encourage people. That's true. I mean, your your statement of we want we should continue to be a learner. I wonder, I know that as we age, we can still grow new neurons. That is the hardest statement to say clearly. And I wonder if, because I've always said that I think modern life is not healthy for us. You know, we've got the stress, we've got pollution, we've got yes. depression, we've got screaming people on the internet. We just got like, whoa, we're just, it's just bleh. Really, oh. modern life, not so great. But I'm wondering if we get to a point in our adult life, you know, it could be early on, mid, mid of the middle of our lives, wherever, where we just kind of feel like we've accomplished our career goals and we've, you know, we've raised our children or whatever, and, and we kind of subconsciously stop learning. Mm-hmm. My, my pandemic hobby was, mm-hmm. and it's, I'm still doing it, is making greeting cards and we were in, my Lord, <laughs> we have so many keepsake containers <laughs> that we were, I was trying to go through them and like, okay, we got to, I know I have whittled them down a lot and then my dad died. So we, I got more of his stuff and then, you know, it's just like, it's like a never ending spigot of family memories that don't have a lot of context because of Alzheimer's. But I was going through them and I was looking at this one card and my husband was like, oh, that's one of the first cards you made me. And I'm like, wow, I've really come a long way. And it's like, I really enjoy learning new techniques on, on making greeting cards. You know, this is not earth shattering 
you know, going to change the world, you know, might make somebody smile for a few minutes and maybe a few minutes when they pick up the card again. But, you know, I've learned a ton in just over a year on card making techniques. And so that can't possibly not be good for my brain. That didn't sound like very good. Grammar. You never know when that, you never know when that skill gets pulled into something else. You never know. You may find yourself in 18 months working at some digital greeting card company, right? You never know when that same technology has helped to make um, the new information packet that goes inside of a, a Tesla or something like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there's these skills that we pick up and that's something I learned from returning to my martial arts practice was realizing that there's skills that you pick up that are applicable in so many other places. And that that's why so much of the lore of martial arts happens with around people who are monks or priests, because there's some time about reflection and meditation or prayer. And then being in that moment and being with the flow and understanding, you know, the difference between being a great swordsman and making a really good cup of coffee, not that different, right? Because it's really about present and it's about process. Um, and you see that in so many places. And I think that's one of the journeys I had to learn was like, you know, at one point I was a man, I was a manager for hip hop artists, you know, and they're like young rock stars, right? And I have to use my charisma my willpower and my physicality to make sure they go to bed on time and they get up and they pack their bags and don't spend any too much money. And then you wake up one day and you're using those same skills to plan doctor's appointments, to make sure that this nurse comes over at this time to plan the injections. Now, don't get me wrong. I was terrible at all this when it first started. I, I Man, God bless him. I mean, my dad was so patient with me. I just could not figure out how to do an injection. I kept missing the vein. Then I got to a point where I just realized I have to take him to the doctor because they have a clinic and they'll do it for me, right? Um, but there's other things that I got masterful because some skill that I told myself, well, you'll never put that on your LinkedIn. That's not useful. It showed up in so many other ways. And so who knows where... I'd be curious that if we talked again in 20 years, what that greeting card shows up as, right? That's true. I mean, 20 years, 20 years from now is almost a scary age number, except for the fact that my paternal grandmother lived to be 103. So yeah. I, I have that uh, marker to aim right. for easily. Yeah. You just, you never know where it's going to go. I mean, I'm, I'm counting on that. I mean, I make the joke that in my generation, back to the Gen, Gen X thing, when I was at, when I was leaving high school, I used to spend a lot of time on this artifact called America Online. And so that's what yeah. got me into tech, right? <laughs> I so remember. the fact that I spent two years doing work right here with this, there's so many other people whose brains were not prepared to work from home, even though they wanted to work from home. Whereas me, I'm like, I grew up in there. This is, what are you talking about? This is easy to me. So again, I, I'd be curious to see where these greeting cards show up later. Right. Like the other perfect example is um, the famous. I don't know if you ever saw that famous speech that Steve Jobs gave at Stanford. People always throw it around and tech all the time. Um, but, you know, the idea that him spending so much time studying calligraphy and type fonts led to why the computer has these exact things. Well, type fonts, what? That's that's greeting cards. Right. Like you never know these places that your focus on the skill is going to show up in some other. So I'm always encouraging uh, anybody in our journey to be, pay attention to what they're, the kind of the things that they're investing 1% into, because they're going to add up and realizing that they do have the skills to be the great caregiver that they need to their parents. They just need to have to tap into it. And then also that there are skills throughout it that are going to be show up in other places. Makes sense, especially for the younger caregivers. I worry about, you know, young caregivers in their early 30s yeah. who have left the workforce because they don't have enough options to take care of, the, you know, like work from home and take care of a parent. And it's like, okay, well, my mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years. So if you leave, if you leave the workforce at 30 and your parent lives another 12 years that makes you looking for a career job in your 40s 
right now that's that's not a good thing. So it's I like what you're saying because we caregivers have a lot more managerial and you know like organizational skills than yes. any corporation is going to easily admit. You I mean you're going to have to like hopefully we can start changing people's thoughts on that, but yeah, it's it's insane. But we've been chatting for a while and we haven't really talked about your album. So let's, but let's I, think everything, I mean, that's you just hit the nail on the head. That's literally why I titled it The Long Goodbye, um, which you and I know is a code word for Alzheimer's. Um, for me, it was a double entendre because I quit my music career to take care of my father. And there are some points there. I mean, I think initially I was concerned that maybe, you know, I think the first thing that happens, you know, there's those five stages of grief, right? And then when you become a caregiver, you learn about anticipatory grief. So you begin to grieve a parent who has not passed away, but is clearly not here anymore. So you blame yourself, right? Um, and somehow in my mind, if I had, instead of spending time learning how to be one of the best rappers in the world, if I had spent all this time, I could have, I, I would be a scientist right now, and I, like my brother, and I would have cured the disease, right? You know, you know, the, the nonsense. Instead, I had to go through a different journey and kind of talk myself through it and say, you know what? If you get up in the morning at five and leave San Francisco and drive over to pick up your father from the Alzheimer's home at eight and get him to an appointment at nine and you're late three times in a row, the reality of the situation is you have a drinking problem. <laughs> That's just it. You, you have a drinking problem. That's why you're categorically late. If this is important to you, you will change your life. And you will show up for this. And that's fundamentally what I did in a lot of ways. I remember buying this giant cabinet, sort of like uh, um, like Ikea set where I had all my suits in it and it had this big mirror. And I would just sit there and look in the mirror for hours and make sure I knew when I was lying to myself, my facial expressions. Because it was so easy to think, to go check the box. I'm being a good son. I'm being a caregiver. Do you have the data to prove it? Um, and so back to what you're talking about, that long goodbye can mean so many things. If somebody's going to leave a career, not every, you know, when I started being a caregiver, I didn't have a partner. I didn't have, you know, uh, I didn't have my, I hadn't met my girlfriend yet. <laughs> so I was doing this all by myself. My older brothers were in different States. Uh, I was just trying and I had two sick parents with two very different illnesses on two different sides of a bridge. Right. And if not for maybe, the efforts of, you know, my, my, my younger siblings, shout out Ann and Eric, I, I probably would have ground myself. I probably would have like unintentionally killed or hurt myself trying to take care of my parent because I fundamentally was not taking care of the basic physiology, like eating and drinking water and stretching. And, you know, I smoke cigarettes and all these, all these things that are just, it's not helping the cause. So getting past a lot of that, I wanted to be able to hand something to somebody at any stage of the caregiving journey and say, I'm here with you. I'm present with you. And I want to let you know that you're not alone. And there's a bunch of us who are going to walk aside with you. And they're also waiting for you on the other side of that waterfall. And we don't have to talk about where that waterfall is. Okay. We don't need to think about the day that your parent dies, but I cannot let you go on this journey and believe the mythology, which I believe is Alzheimer's doing, that you are alone. Because I think we've all felt that as caregivers, that we are the only people dealing with this on the planet. I remember when I went, I went to three different support group meetings. I went to one in Arizona um, because, you know, I had to go to one and it was helpful, but I was also like, wow, I am so young compared to the people in this room. <laughs> That's and how then I, I went felt. To I felt it mine. I was the youngest caregiver because most of them were spouses. Yeah. And then the other people my age were there supporting their parent who was taking care of a spouse. And yes. I was also the person whose loved one had had Alzheimer's the longest. So I'm like, I win. <laughs> I right. win the booby prize. Right, right. You're like, wow, okay, I get the steak knives, right? Yeah. Then, it's like, um, this is, this is, I picked the wrong door. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Behind behind number three, yeah. Um, I went to one in Oakland uh, at Kaiser, and that's when I it was informative. Let me start there. 
It was informative. I learned that Alzheimer was black. I learned all these things. But I also was the only male in the room. I was single. I was early mid career. And so as helpful as it was with data, it was so isolated. And then I went to my first, I think it was like, it was out like some other one. I couldn't, cause you know, it clogs, it all kind of crowds mm-hmm. together after a while in your brain. Um, it was like the young professionals of color, Alzheimer's support. Group. And I remember me sitting down and I was just like crying like a child and shaking when I'd hear people talk, because I was like, I literally thought that I was the only one dealing with this. Like, I'm not happy that you're dealing with this, but I'm actually so relieved because so much like hearing somebody struggling to figure out how to wash their parent or figuring out how to get off time for work or wow. You know, and then I remember somebody I met there was like, yeah, you can always tell because you can always tell like a a caregiver is always very present. They're always on top of it. They're always controlling, but they're always one word away from crying. You can see it right in their eyes. You can see them in a cross in a room. They're always got that water eyes. Yep. Uh, They got me into watching this show called The Wire. And they were talking about, I don't know if you ever saw it. It's it's like Mm. a cop show, but they're talking about soft eyes and how it it changes your perception, how you have to start leaning into your intuition a little bit more. You don't always have the ability to go to your parent and say, what's wrong with your leg? You got to kind of feel your way through it and figure it out and kind of reverse engineer and then talk to the doctor. Well, I think I see some, something going on in the veins. And then when they walk, they limp and, but this, so I'm thinking it's these three things. Can you test for it? Oh, door number two. I was right, you know? Um, and so a lot of that, I was trying to, with the long goodbye, do two things. Explain why I had walked away from rap without an explanation and why, and I don't say I would come, I'd come back, but I wanted to give a journey to my fans of what was more important. And the other side is I wanted to give an instruction manual for any caregiver at any time, even if you don't like the lyrics. At a certain point, the music and the production is high level. Um, My wife made 99% of the music. Uh, She's an incredible composer. But you should be able to just even put on the instrumentals and run three miles and feel like you're, you know, because again, anybody who's, who's new to this, Cardio eats Alzheimer's plaques for lunch. Cardio loves to beat up on Alzheimer's. Yay me. I don't run, but I, I'm a cyclist and a Peloton. Yeah, no, you get it. You're, I'm one and, of them crazy Peloton people. <laughs> thank you for reminding me I need to get back on my bike. Um, but yeah, I think, and you feel it and you know it. And the grief lives in your lungs. And when you, one of the healthiest things you can do is when you start sweating and doing something that makes you breathe, you know, Hopefully, hopefully you're doing it outside with a mask on, right? But when you're doing that and you feel it cleanse yourself, you can you can process things a lot better. So I wanted to try to give these these moments, but also capture lyrically and conceptually some of these decisions that were made. Um, the first song was called Diagnosis, and it's in it's it's almost an infomercial of where we're at with this disease and the, this the rates. Um, and I wanted. I wanted to capture the idea of what it feels like um, to get this diagnosis, you know, to, I remember distinctly it happened on my birthday and on the moment they my dad a, a mental check. And when he didn't pass, they took his license, you know? Right. And so it was like, we had to leave his car, take him home and then go back and get the car. It was, it was, it, it just, you, you know, no one's yep. gonna, no one tells you that. There's no blog out there that says be prepared. Yeah. Be prepared. If this test doesn't go the way you think, your whole day and week and month is going to change with your parent. And who and how did that affect him at that time? You know, I remember his shoulders dropped and I never saw them come back up again. I was like, wow, why would you, why do we need to do this here and now at this day? You know? Um, and so trying to talk about those things. The second song is called Cliff, and my father's name was Clifford, but uh, it's an acronym for Can't Live If Father Fails, and it's about framing for a caregiver, understanding what's really important, because I think you can get caught up in your own grief, and that can lead to self-pity, and that can be your biggest boundary. But if you really are in touch, you know, I'm lucky, by the way. I had a fantastic father. I had a very loving, amazing 
gorgeous father. Even when he was wrong, he was right. You know, I often say <laughs> wife, when I was a kid, I thought he was the meanest, most prescient, omnipresent tyrant I had ever met. It was like I was being raised by Thanos from, from, from the Avengers, right? He was, every time I did something wrong, he would just pop out of somewhere and catch me, you know, like I, I was literally like, you'd be on the street, literally about to try your first cigarette and your dad comes out of nowhere. Like what, what, where? <laughs> but now I live in this world of, of a pandemic and a recession and all these other factors that we're trying to deal with. And I realized maybe my dad wasn't hard enough on me. Maybe the things that he taught me prepared me. And this is why I'm not sick. This is why I'm not in the hospital. This is why I'm not, haven't had these issues because my dad, enforced i think sounds like a lot like your dad's journey um my dad didn't go to the military but everybody else in his family did and he was raised that way so there's this sort of you know marine corps navy seal aspect to my father that got you up at five in the morning and i say go you go and and you you drop and give me 20 kind of mentality um and so i think what i learned from that journey is also not everybody had the best situation with their parents not everybody has the ability to say, have kind memories. And so a lot of resentment comes up for them. Uh, knowing that I was fortunate, I tried to try to talk about these things and say, what's really important here? You've made a choice. You made a choice to be a caregiver. Hold on to that. You're not forced to do this. This is not a have to do. You want to do this. You're going to be great at it. Um, don't live in resentment. It's, it's, it's corrosive. It's destructive. It's going to get in the way. It's going to keep you from keeping a job, meeting a great partner. You know, um, there's other parts of the album where it's harder to deal with. I have a song, you know, um, I have two songs called Day Nooning and Mexicali Rose, which is talking about, you know, these factors like day nooning about parents not knowing what time of day it is, and being trying to get out of the house at four in the morning. They can't tell the difference or, Sometimes these, in aggressive cases, parents with Alzheimer's can get violent. They can't tell the difference between their child and a burglar. And it's not them, it's the disease. Um, I, I try to frame these as ways of talking about them directly. And I think that's one of the powers of hip hop music and punk rock, at least the ones that I grew up in. There was some redeeming qualities and power to it, but there's this idea that we could talk about the dark times and turn them into good times without putting anyone down. And that's what I really tried to capture and say, there's some of these aspects. And I think um, the biggest highlight to me also is one of the songs at the end of the album is called Quality of Life. And it's about evaluating what I wanted to do for my life now that I'd lost my father, that he asked me in the beginning, you need to promise me that you're going to have a good life after this is over. You cannot let this make you sick. And once I realized my ability to start doing that, to, you know, meet the, 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 the person of my dreams who became my wife, to, to, to travel, to go and be able to live in another country, to get a master's degree, to build amazing businesses that employ people and do great things. Um, all of those superpowers came from my journey as a caregiver. Um, but you have to hold that as the goal. You have to remind people that that's got to be the goal at the end of this is that you should come out of this with a sense of when it's your time, what is it going to feel like, right? And so even me, as I start my journey and I start thinking about being a parent, trying to make sure that I have a conversation with my child at a certain age that says, there's going to be a point when dad can't be dad as much anymore. And let's be, let's be honest about that. So um, I try to put all those experiences into one album without making it feel overcrowded, but, and giving enough space to say, these are all these emotions that go on. And, and yes, you're going to be surprised. There's people that you swore were always going to be there to help take care of your parents and they're not going to show up. And you can't let that eat you alive. And then you're also going to find strengths within you and your family that you never knew was there. And you can't also be surprised by that either. And that, that is this journey that we have together that I call the long goodbye. Awesome. Now, where can people find your album so that they can benefit and listen and enjoy? 
Um, so the first single came out October 25th. It is called Fog on the Bridge. And you can find it on all your streaming platforms as well as purchasing. Um, and Fog on the Bridge is literally inspired by getting calls at four in the morning and being told that I need to go see my father and take him to the ER and somehow being able to get over the bridge. And you know what I'm, I could tell by your nod, you know what I'm talking about. Well, we're um, talking about the, the Golden Gate Bridge. Right, right. Or or the Bay Bridge, right? Just being able to somehow get from San Francisco to Oakland in 10 minutes. And not necessarily because of speeding, but because, you know, there's nobody on the bridge in the middle of the night. But the yeah. idea, there's nothing but fog in you in the car. But the idea is how focused you can be when you are called to duty and that parent needs you. And then can you apply that to the other aspects of your life? Um and at that time, I was taking care of my, my dad. I was starting my practice into Tai Chi. And it just, I started to notice the same movements of Tai Chi felt like how the car and the fog would move on the bridge. And I was like, if you could be just that effective every day, imagine it without draining your kidneys and being adrenalized and in panic. mode. So uh, the full album comes out December 4th. You can find it on Spotify. If you're an Apple music person, you'll find it there too. Deezer, YouTube Music, all your st- normal platforms. If you go to uh, TLGB album, the long goodbye album dot com, um, you could find the album there um, and download it. Um, and then also on December 4th, uh, I am partnering with the Alzheimer's Services of the East Bay and proceeds of this album will be going to them and their daycare programs. As the album grows, I hope to expand it to give to all Alzheimer causes. There's many people who don't know about respite programs or the day programs you were suggesting. They don't know that these are resources. Um, So I'm trying to partner with my local uh, day program because they need the help. Um, These great programs you were talking about earlier about bringing kids in, about doing masks, they have to be paid for, believe it or not. Um, And so that's why I'm doing this. I don't, I don't, I'm fine. I'm, I'm good enough. I don't need to make money off rap music. I've done really well for myself. Um, but these Alzheimer's services need it. And more than anything, awareness needs to be put out there. And so that's what it is. So I'll definitely make sure I get you the link if you want to post it up uh, when this podcast comes out. I definitely will do that. I appreciate it. I've talked to lots of caregivers who've written books yeah. or some have made apps. You are yeah. the first one that's written an album. And more to come. More to come. There's a couple movies out there that are great. The, sub- the subjects are hard, but they're uh, accurate. You know, the more we work on it, the more we can do it. And then I think the last thing I would say to caregivers is back to my quality of life statement, who's taking care of the caregiver? Yeah. Are you eating? And if you really, you know, are you eating and exercising in a way that's going to prevent this disease? It's possible. That's one of the things I learned, you know, you know, that's the thing that they tell you is uh, hospitals will never say your father is going to die this week. Instead, no. what they'll say, right? They have cute language. You should really spend as much time as possible and make it a quality of life conversation. That's their way of telling you your dad's going to die in a couple of days. Been there. But I also <laughs> learned during those combos, rosemary, turmeric, anti-inflammatories, right? You know where I'm going with this. Champagne, yep. surprisingly. Cardio. Think about all the things that can change your DNA today that better your defense against Alzheimer's. And who knows, maybe in 20 years, there's a gene therapy or a vaccine for Alzheimer's as well. But we are we are going to win this battle. I'm convinced. I'm a very good strategist. I've got my wife has gotten me out of being uh, vengeful. But there's one vengeance I'm not letting go of is Alzheimer's. I'm I'm there's a big thing that kids are doing called cancel culture. I want to cancel. <laughs> yep, me too. I keep I, telling I, I, people. And I'm not going to lose. So that's where I'm really interested in every strategy we can employ. So I appreciate you having me. Well, thank you very much. And I hope everybody goes and gives the album a listen. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.